Hi, uh, I'm Rachel. Uh, I am a woman with, a white woman with straight blonde hair in my 40s and I'm a production manager. I'm the resident production manager for Theatre Alibi, I'm also freelance and unlike a lot of the people you're going to hear from today, I am not an expert in sustainability um, nor am I an expert in public speaking. <laughs> but, um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm early on in my uh, journey into um, including environmental sustainability in my practice. Uh, but it's something I've been mulling on for a while. And Roberta suggested that maybe that I bring some of the things I've been mulling on to this event. Um, so I've been thinking for some time about how, particularly at, we at Theatre Alibi, align our personal views with our professional practice. And I think that's probably something that a lot of people will be able to relate to and identify with in that um, a lot of us are aware of the climate crisis and there's perhaps things we're doing in our day to day lives at home that we're not really following through in our working practice. And so I was interested in about how we could do that better. Uh, and that led me to the Green Theatre event at the Bristol Vic where I've met Roberta. Um, and then we became part of the case study. And it was during that production that was part of the case study, Riverland, that I started to think about how we could make our sustainability goals more achievable. And I was kind of aware that there were some existing uh, sustainability uh, networks and groups in the Southwest and, and certainly companies who were um, already uh, being quite environmentally conscious in their work. Um, but for one reason or another, I didn't really engage or use those existing networks. And I started to think about why that was, what were the pitfalls and the barriers that were stopping me from interacting with those existing groups. Um, and then I started to think about what I wanted and needed from a group or a network, and also what I and Theatre Alibi as a company could offer and give to any existing network. Um, and just a little note on language. Um, the, these things have lots of different names, uh, networks, hubs, um, systems. I don't really like any of the names. I don't think any of them really properly describe the sort of thing that I'm after. Um, they, they, they sound too structured and formal. And I think that's because uh, long term, I think the goal should be that organically we do the things that I'm going to be talking about as part of our practice anyway. Uh, I'm fully aware that we probably need structures first of all, to get to that end point. So I'm going to use the word system for now, even though I'm not particularly fond of it. Um, so I, I consider that there's three key support structures that need to happen to allow any system to uh, operate, uh, that underpin it. Um, so th these are the things that I would like to see. Um, I think system needs to be accessible and available. Uh, by available, I mean that first and foremost, we need to know that it exists. Um, I'm aware that as I'm talking about the things that I'd like to see in a system that somebody might think, oh, that system exists, I know about it, or I run it, or, um, but I'm somebody who's actively wanting to be more sustainable in my practice and I don't know about it. So I think we need to then ask ourselves why that is and how we can make those systems more available to the people who want to be actually using them. Uh, by accessibility, obviously, I mean that any system that exists should be available to those who want to use it, no matter who they are, and also should be welcoming to those people to should say, if you want to be more environmentally sustainable in your practice, we are for you. Um, and I, I mean that because we in the arts are very good at being gatekeepers. Uh, we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. Um, and uh, we operate in almost like circles of clout uh, where we can see ourselves uh, uh, being in a certain circle which maybe doesn't belong in another circle. Sometimes we look down on other people's work or sometimes we see another circle and think we don't deserve to be in that for whatever reason, be it the size of the work, the structures, the funding. Uh, we could talk about the systemic problems of the arts for ages. So what I'll say <laughs> is that in a system, I think that we need to be ignoring those circles or working outside of them. Um, and also, the reason why we're here, I think we need to be working cross sectors as well. I think we need to be not thinking about a system that works for entertainment, um, education or for the theatre sector, but a system that just works for those who want to use it. Um, the second uh, support structure I think that a uh, system needs um, is that it needs to be sustainable within itself. It needs to not be held by one person or one group. 
Um, it needs to be able to survive under its own steam so that when inevitably whoever's first set it up is unable to keep it going, moves away, um, that it can continue to exist. And that links into what I think the third system uh, support structure is, which is that it needs to not be labour intensive to maintain. Um, so it needs to be um, easily uh, sustainable. It needs to not be overly concerned with databases and inventories, um, uh, a large mailing list that needs to be maintained. Uh, and lastly, I think that systems really need to look at being regional. And I know that the UK globally is quite a small region, but I think we need to work in even more local spheres than that as well. And I think that once you go regional, that actually helps support those other structures of accessibility and availability and low maintenance and communication. Um, so then I want to talk a little bit about what I think the practical things I'd like to see in a system are. Um, so I consider them to be stages, and I think that's because I'm a production manager and I like the idea of a timeline that easily evolves from one thing to another, but I don't think that maybe that's necessarily true and you could probably just lump the whole thing and go for it. Um, but I'm going to talk about them in stages. Um, the first is concerned with knowledge sharing, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, and that could be something like sharing your experience of using something like the Theatre Green Book, the pros and cons of that, what you learned, what you, uh, what you, how the small wins that you had, the big wins that you had. Um, it could be that you're great at um, data keeping and evidencing and that you're willing to share that experience. Uh, whatever it may be, it's concerned with communication and basically it's the people within the group of the structure saying that we are willing to be contacted. You can talk to us and we will respond. So it's a commitment to being open in your communication about what you're doing. Um, the second is concerned with resources. This is the big one. And this is the one that I think has uh, the most pitfalls attached to it, but it's the thing that we actually, I think, are most keen to see happen, uh, which is the sharing of our stuff, the material stuff. And when I say sharing, um, I mean that that can exist in a, a variety of different ways. Sharing can be lending stuff out of the goodness of your heart. It can be lending stuff in exchange for favours in kind, for donations to your company. You can hire stuff, you can sell stuff. Um, so when I talk about sharing, I mean that in a plethora of different ways. Um, what the, the key thing is how we impart the information about what it is we've got to share uh, to the people who potentially can have it from us. Uh, I talked a little bit about how uh, it needs to be low labour, so that's when I, uh, I want to talk about inventories. I really hate the idea of inventory keeping. I think that's where a lot of things fall down. Um, those of us who are responsible for inventory keeping for our own companies know that it's really difficult to keep on top of your own inventory, never mind managing other people's as well. Um, so I've started to think about what possibilities of what that could look like beyond an inventory. So I think we need to just um, talk in broad strokes about what it is that we've got and are willing to share. Um, so that we share with our system, the other groups in our system, the things that we've got that we're willing to part with. Um, so that when people come to the system and say, oh, we're looking for something, they know where to point them. So for example, if somebody came to the system and was after projectors, the other people within that system would know to come to me because I've got a lot of projectors. Um, but they, if someone was looking for a, a large amount of period costumes, they wouldn't point them my way because that's not something that's in my list of things that I've got. So it'd be broad strokes, I think, is the way forward. Um, um, so then that takes us to the third stage of my system, um, which is concerned with planning and planning in a way that helps arts move towards a more circular economy. I'm um, aware when I'm talking about this stage that it's quite theatre orientated, um, but there might be ways that other art sectors can uh, pick up what I'm saying and work it into their own practice. Um, so this is something that came to mind while we were working on Riverland, um, something quite serendipitous. I, I was working for, on a different show uh, and I went to pick something up from a theatre and in their scene dock they had some trees. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm doing a show in quite a few months' time that's probably going to have some trees in it. And they said, well, we're doing a show with a lot of trees in May. If you can pick them up in the last week of May, you can have them all. So I took the photos of the trees and I sent them to the designer and she was like, great, I'll work it into the design, brilliant. 
And then I thought, how can we make this happen? How can this be replicated so it's not just a serendipitous event, that it's not just luck that this has happened? Um, and I know that there's Facebook groups that exist um, that when people are doing get outs and strikes, they put, they've got something that needs to be collected. But quite often the window of opportunity from that post being posted to when you have to collect the thing is less than a week. Um, so again, it relies a lot on luck that you've got to be there at the right time in the right place to be able to pick the stuff up. Um, and, uh, and so I'd love for something to happen where there was a, uh, a period of planning that allowed uh, for a larger circle to happen. So something like when you're in or close to your final design stages and you know there's going to be some things that in a few months time you're not going to have the room for, that you know that, oh, this show is going to have a few large flats, maybe some furniture, flooring, that you're not going to have the storage space for at the end of the project. You start talking about those things then at that point in time. Um, so that people in their early design phases can see the things that potentially could be used in their own design process. Um, I am fully aware that there are pitfalls to the things that I'm suggesting, that they're road bumps. I think there are problems uh, to be overcome to do with artistic ownership. I think there's problems to be overcome with our habit of uh, having last minute changes in our practice. Um, I don't have the answers to those, but what I do now I think is that we just need to go for it and try and that the more we do it, the more we break those habits. Um, uh, and I don't have an answer about platforms either, about how we uh, sort these structures and systems out. Um, I know that Facebook is very popular. I personally am not a fan of Facebook because I don't think it's accessible. Not so A lot of people don't like to be on it. Um, a, you're then a slave to the Facebook algorithm. Um, it doesn't post things chronologically. It posts things in terms of how popular it thinks things are. And so posts get lost. Um, so I don't think it's the ideal solution. I don't know what the ideal solution is. I've been playing with the idea of Google Drives and things like that. So if anyone has any bright ideas about how a system could exist, that would be great. Um, but uh, yeah, the, that's uh, sort of the, the framework that I've been playing with in my mind with uh, structures of accessibility and availability, low maintenance, self-sustaining, that supports knowledge sharing, resource sharing and planning for circular economies. Um, and then I think we're going to hear from Emma and Simon, um, who already run some, some groups that may well have solved some of the problems that I've been thinking about. And then I'd love to hear about any other things that are happening and any other ideas that people have got that might be able to answer some of the questions that I've got. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So um, she's posed a challenge. Rachel's posed a challenge to us. How do we create this network? It, or system, we're not going to call it a, a, how do we create the system, what systems are similar that already exist, how do we not re reinvent the wheel, what do we learn from others in developing this, um, and so on. So thank you very much. Rachel also reminded me that we, um, and it was me who actually sent out the request that we should do visual descriptions um, for our colleagues who are blind and um, have visual impairments. So I am a white woman in my mid 50s. I'm wearing glasses. I have long, um, dark hair that is curly and is up in a bun. Um, we were talking, Rachel was talking um, about the importance of sharing and storage. This is something that has come up over and over again and always comes up in theatre making practice about, you know, if we want to work in a circular economy principle, um, then we need to be able to find out where things are being stored and how that they can access them. Um, inventories come up over and over again. This is a pretty long term issue. One of the other things that came up um, now that I'm thinking about it in relation to findings related to the project actually relates to procurement and materials histories as well. So um, even when you do get things secondhand, you're not always sure about where those materials came from in the first place. So you're, you're sort of looking at, at chains of, um, of materialities and material histories. Um, and sometimes you don't actually know what the materials and the objects are that you are using in the first place. So it start, um, you know, these aren't necessarily bad or terrible things, but they are questions that have come up uh, repeatedly over 
the uh, across the people that we've been talking with um, to do the case studies. We had a question about where these Facebook groups are <laughs> that people can um, share and swap with. Um, certainly there are some resource networks and we'll try to pull together a list of, of resources for, for folks who need them. But um, again, keen not to reinvent the wheel because there are some really great um, resource lists out there about companies and productions and individuals who want to uh, reuse and find materials. And, okay, so with that, I'm going to move to Simon. Um, who is the convener from GMAST and has found many solutions <laughs> to some of the, the problems and questions, but is also going to um, give us a sort of, uh, I don't know, inspirational <laughs> thinking around the, some inspirational thinking around the creation of place-based networks. Simon. Great. Thanks, Roberta. So hi, I'm Simon. Uh, I'm a white man in his late 40s uh, and I'm wearing a hat. I do have a cold and there are also some really noisy scaffolders working outside my uh, uh, office window. So but I'm going to give it my best. And anyway, uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, to join. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I act as convener, uh, as Roberta mentioned, for a place-based network called GMAST uh, that's evolved here from the uh, Manchester Arts Sustainability team. But we don't tend to use those words anymore, uh, and I'm going to explain why. Uh, for one, we operate regionally, so Manchester doesn't really cover it, and it's really important that larger places don't overshadow smaller ones. Arts can sometimes sound not very inclusive. Sustainability doesn't kind of cover it anymore. Uh, I prefer to think about things as being more regenerative. Team is okay, but we like together more and we're literally greater together. Still, what's in a name? <laughs> This session is called uh, is titled Creating Networks, and I'm going to take some time to talk you talk you through kind of how our networks evolved and and some interesting things uh, along the way. Just going to see if I can get my. There you go. Uh, a frog does not drink. Uh, frog does not drink up the pond in which it lives. Uh, today, I'm uh, shamelessly adapting a presentation I gave back uh, in March from for the uh, National Museum Directors Conference. Museums like theatres uh, are up in the game when it comes to what we tend to group together and call uh, uh, call climate. Um, and you might hear uh, or use the words mitigation, adaptation and resilience um, uh, when you talk about climate. And they're as good a frame as any for our conversation today. And I went back to the definition of those words uh, when putting this presentation together and focused on their meaning. Mitigation, as defined by the Oxford English Dictionary, the action of reducing the severity, seriousness or painfulness of something. Well, we all likely agree we find ourselves in a very serious climate and ecological situation, and many of us are working to make it less severe. Um, it has been and will continue to be painful uh, in all kinds of ways, and in order to really mitigate it, we have to confront its origins. I've been thinking a lot recently about knowledge and wisdom and how they're different. And last Christmas, I read uh, Amitav Ghosh's The Nutmeg's Curse. A colleague recommended uh, his work, and in turn, so do I. As a South Asian man uh, now living in Brooklyn, he's really challenged my Western perspective on climate and helped me develop a language to join up some things that I knew were connected. When I was originally preparing this uh, presentation, there was a slide limit and, uh, uh, and I wanted to talk much more about people. Uh, so I decided not to waste these slides on logos and timelines and photos all designed to make it look very slick. And instead, I've opted for six proverbs that I think are relevant and inspired me along the way. They are attributed to Native American peoples uh, across the last few hundred years. Uh, peoples whose history I discovered uh, I didn't really know terribly much about and a colonial history that is uh, beyond terrible. 
you can't wake a person who's pretending to be asleep. It's been over 10 years since culture convened uh, to respond to Manchester's first climate change policy. Uh, and as I said, I wanted to share our experiences uh, uh, and those we've had of working together. We think of this as a form of adaptation, the action or process of adapting or being adapted, or more poignantly, perhaps through a biology lens, the process of change by which an organism or species becomes better suited to its environment. A collaborative journey started here in Manchester that would see the development of a regional cultural network focusing on climate. It also brought a relatively new Julie's Bicycle uh, to Manchester and started what's been a, a, a long lasting relationship. Since that first gathering in Manchester Art Gallery, probably about 11 years ago, we slowly developed a community within the cultural sector, learning and sharing uh, our experience with each other. And right from the beginning, our ethos was that this was a collective challenge uh, that we have to meet by working together, that we share each other's successes, whether gaining knowledge or developing practice, and that we would approach our impact as a sector and uh, embrace local targets. Back then, green or environmental uh, wasn't front and centre as uh, as it is now. Those acting uh, those acting on it in the cultural landscape were often lone voices within their organisations. You know, and if anyone ever asks us, I think about what G Master's been good at, we say that it's brought those people together and developed them. Tell me, and I'll forget. Show me, and I may not remember. Involve me and I'll understand. As the years rolled by, the momentum and commitment grew and our collective impact reduced. Remarkable that all this happened through a period of uh, considerable funding reduction for city and sector, uh, the period we quaintly called austerity. Um, but change was happening. Uh, and also there began to, began to emerge some incredible engagement projects. And they're now a regular part of many organizations programming culture, bringing stories to life that are meaningful for our communities and help develop that all important emotional connection that drives action. After five years, we were a much larger group, including art centres, theatres, museums, galleries, festivals, broadcasters, music venues, production companies and more, exploring the challenges and meeting them together. And ultimately, we became involved in city policy development, uh, little did we know how unusual this was, culture and climate working together. In our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. In 2018, Manchester's good practice was recognised by the uh, EU's URBAC programme and its focus is driving change for better cities. It presented the uh, Manchester model and its contribution to the city's climate change policies. And we began to explore how we could share, uh, uh, how we could share what we've learned. The project became known as Sea Change and would run across three years. And it was a different kind of project for Urbac because it involved cities and their cultural sector to network, collaborate, and then shape action together. And all cities uh, are very different, but all have culture at their heart. And in most cases, because we were visiting, it, it was the very first time culture and environment had been asked how they could work together. The project had four main strands that I think are really useful when we think about networks. Uh, uh, and, uh, and those strands are collaboration between the city and sector, support from the city and the tools and skills to explore environmental action, policy, understanding climate change targets and getting involved in developing them and engagement, looking at how culture can be in conversation with communities and generate meaningful activities to connect us on climate. And the results of that project were kind of amazing. And all of the cities changed how they're connecting climate and culture with each other. Uh, uh, and culture became involved in developing local policy and strategy. But most importantly, perhaps, in creating community engagement through cultural activities. Now, GMAST is part of uh, the Manchester Climate Change Partnership, and that's a sector-led approach 
directing the work of our local climate change agency. The University of Manchester participates, as does MMU, uh, and local networks focusing on health and well-being, social housing, faith, and they come together with the city council, business, the airport, the Blue Football Club, and the power network operator for the North West. There's also a youth board. The model provides new connections in the city and brings together, brings sectors together who, who might not have uh, naturally collaborated. It has academic learning at its heart and, uh, uh, and that's how it evolves strategy. And it helps us as a cultural network define our future focus. Uh, and recent projects have included exploring consumption-based emissions and adaptation and resilience planning. Many minds, many perspectives, great thinkers and great communicators. Um, as a cultural network, we've looked hard at the barriers to action and developed resources to help instill the confidence to build a more sustainable approach into cultural practice. Cultural organisations that bring together knowledge and stories are an amazing bridge. Some organisations, of course, are well on their journey, others just starting out. Um, but our ethos for the network remains the same, that we're in this together. Give me one second as my frozen PowerPoint. There you go. Uh, hold on to what is good, even if it's a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it's a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even, it's a, even if it's a long way from here. Hold on to your life, even if it's easier to let go. Hold on to my hand, even if someday I'll be gone away from you. Resilience, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. The example definition uh, uh, <laughs> made me smile. The often remarkable resilience of so many British institutions. Well, remarkable indeed. Um, I'm sure I'm sure I don't need to kind of talk about resilience to this group um, who've weathered all kinds of things across the past few years and, and certainly uh, times are challenging right now. Resilience is of course about managing it personally, organisationally um, in the face of these challenges. Challenge that comes through our rapidly evolving world. Challenge that comes from our obsession with extracting resources challenge that comes from government policy in all kinds of ways challenge that comes through holding to values in the public domain challenge that comes from truly embracing divestment embedding circularity effectively decarbonizing your operation your practice your cafe your gift shop choosing when and how to travel challenge that comes from telling those stories that expose the pain of our history. How can we change without accepting it? Climate doesn't sit on its own. So much is related. And so challenging, challenging inequalities everywhere has to be part of what we do. I wanted to advocate today that meeting these challenges with a place-based focus can really help us learn and involve our practice. It gets us out of our own echo chamber and embedded into local action. It helps us take our place in a community and collect, uh, connect uh, with policy that will drive change. It makes us question our values and so then our practice. The cultural response to climate is key to the systemic changes we must make. If we only look at this through an economic lens, we are missing too much. All culture created in what we now commonly call the climate crisis must reference it in the choices we are making and the resources we use. Making theatre is a great example of collaboration. It brings together such different skills to make it happen. Uh, even so, it exists within some rather outdated systems and what better place to explore change? It's better, to less, it's better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand. A couple of years ago, we were asked to respond on behalf of the sector 
to our local climate strategy. And, uh, and so we developed a framework to do that. And it talks about understanding policy and our position within the carbon budget, planning further reduction, engaging with people and reducing the impact of cultural places, temporary or permanent and changing our practice. And it also highlights the strengths that our sector brings, and that's to help us imagine, to inspire, to inform, to innovate and include. And we think that's the biggest impact we can have. And at the heart of this framework sits action. But we wonder whether kind of being might be better. We know culture as a convener. Uh, ambassador, placemaker, and part of the health and well-being of our communities of all ages. Advocating, demonstrating, and a safe space to explore our feelings. A great place to examine our fixation with consumption and embrace other models. Working more closely with the wealth of knowledge and uh, wisdom that exists in every place. So over a decade after we started, we now bring together over 60 cultural organisations working across the city region. And we've seen more networks emerge and we're exploring how we can work together across the north with the uh, sale in Leeds and shift in Liverpool, as well as looking at what the network needs to uh, what our network needs to be in the future to better support the sector across our region. And it's really exciting uh, imagining different models of leadership and exploring where and how climate is intertwined with, uh, with other issues. As I said right at the beginning, uh, this story is uh, really about people. The living legacy of that meeting all those years ago is a knowledgeable networked community across our cultural organisations doing brilliant things across the sector in all kinds of ways going well be beyond the typical areas of kind of facilities uh, 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 and in some ways production. And now we're seeing more climate focused roles emerge in the sector. And there is a generation to make them work rich in knowledge and wisdom. Our online home openly shares practice and resources for, for our city region and beyond. And sometimes it just signposts what's already there because it's already been done. Um, as recognized now in national policy, when culture and science come together, the results can be amazing. We were updating uh, the city partnership, uh, uh, um, and this was uh, uh, in the summer, and was commended on delivering the most upbeat presentation of the year. Uh, well, why wouldn't we be upbeat? There is so much to hope for. Climate change is a global issue uh, that also requires understanding and action at a local level. None of us can tackle this alone, and it's perhaps our greatest collective endeavour. Thank you. Hey, I was uh, I was trying to press my applause button. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Simon. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask after after um, Emma's presentation, perhaps Simon, you might think about uh, Rachel's provocation and whether there is anything that you, um, that you experienced that might actually respond to some of the things that Rachel said. And also, Rachel, if you could think of some of the things that Simon said that might actually respond to some of your questions. So I'm just, I'm sort of, yeah, sure. yeah I don't like to spring questions on people. So I thought I would ask you now so you'd have some time to think about it and also um, while Emma's presenting as well, think about some of the things that she is going to raise. So I am incredibly happy to be introducing Emma Whitaker, who's going to be talking about the Greenmakers Initiative. Thank you. Um, so just picking up from, from the earlier presentation, oh, just to give my, my brief audio, uh, late 40s woman, white, stripy shirt. Um, <coughs> so, um, yeah, so if you've just joined, you might not have seen the slide earlier, but if you have, um, then 
it's just to put things in context. So I mentioned earlier that there were these five key areas that um, creatives in Devon were telling me, and these were the, the, the five key things. And um, one of them was opportunities to network with others. And one of the, the ways that we were responding to that was working with umbrella organisations, because obviously there were many different creatives of all different sizes and cultural organisations across Devon. It's really vast and the sector is huge, the creative industry sector. So one of the approaches that we were developing is working with umbrella organisations who could help spread the message and spread support to to others rather than working just one-to-one -one with organisations, which we, we also do as well. Um, so back in um, February 2021, 20, um, uh, I was introduced to Laura Wosley of Make Southwest, who's here in the audience today in the physical room, and um, by the Knowledge Exchange Officer at Low Carbon Devon, Christopher Woodford. And I did a very small amount of research for Laura to support um, a funding bid. Um, but whilst I was talking to Laura, I was thinking, wow, this is a brilliant opportunity. Make Southwest, formerly known as Devon Guild of Craftsmen, um, is a very renowned um, organisation with lots of different members, but also with a wider reach across Devon. And I thought, wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to do something here which could spread the message? Um, and some of my early research, uh, I came across the work of Creative Carbon Scotland, who are real trailblazers in this area, I think. And um, they have developed, um, probably around eight years ago, the um, Green Arts Initiative for cultural organisations in Scotland. And, and then that was later extended to um, individuals and um, creatives more, more broadly. And they provided a, a really fascinating model for those organisations to reduce their carbon footprint, which was to have a pledge. And the pledge was for members to sign up and to reduce their um, carbon footprint, to reduce their environmental impact. And in return, they would be part of the network, they would receive resources, and they would be able to share information with one another. And I thought, well, what would it look like if we were to do this in the Southwest or to do it, this in Devon specifically? And I brought up this idea with Laura and she um, was very enthusiastic and welcoming and um, allowed this to happen really. And together with um, Hannah Mills Brown, who is the Make Southwest project manager, um, Hannah started working on this with me and she, Hannah created this um, great website, uh, which was like the, the, the point where people could um, get this information and begin to, um, begin to learn about how they could get involved. So uh, I'm showing um, the picture of the Make Southwest website. And so people are already going to Make Southwest, but the difference with the Greenmaker Initiative section of the website is that it's not just open to members so members of make southwest have to apply and they have to be um, allowed to join make southwest so it's a it's a professional organization whereas with the green maker initiative it's open to any makers um, who want to take part and so we use the the model of the the pledge um, and um, the the pledge um, says that you're going to um, complete a yearly informal report which again is another idea from creative Cop in scotland but i i wrote a template for that um, pledge based on the research that i was doing and what would be applicable here and so there is a kind of um there's some guidelines there's um there's ideas of how you can begin to um, monitor manage and reduce the environmental impact of your practice. And I thought it was really interesting earlier, Roberta, you were mentioning about measuring carbon footprint and what it means to actually reduce your um, 
um, environmental impact and there is this kind of potential deficit there so we're not introducing an element of competition here but what we're trying to do is is say well what are you doing at the moment where are you what what's your sort of baseline what how are you auditing what you're doing and then where would you like to get to and then how can we support that but really important in all of that is what can you share with other people? What are your what are the actions that you're taking? What are the innovations that you're making that would be useful for other people? So it's really about that knowledge exchange and sharing, which is really key. And so we're able to collect some of that data. Now, because we started this, um, I think we launched it in the SEI um, Sustainable Earth Institute conference in 2021, which was in June. Um, we've had members join up from that point and at any any point from there so we haven't had the sort of the full 12 months maybe some people were 12 months but but most people were joining up from the autumn so we haven't got the, these pledges in yet but that's the whole um, amount of data which will be really interesting to share but we didn't want to wait a whole year to, to get all this this information that we could share with people so um well, this is the, this is, I've just kind of put this together. Uh, Hannah's made this much more beautiful and accessible within the website. I'm just pulling out some of the key themes of the report here. So looking at the things that everyone would be familiar with, whatever sector, but premises, making, distribution, communication, and then breaking those down. Um, these are the things that we're asking people to report on in the pledge. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, but we, we now have 161 makers. Um, which have signed up, signed the pledge, and they, um, what they get for, for signing the pledge is they get to um, use the Green Maker Initiative logo on their publicity as well. So this was designed by two um, uh, uh, design graduates, three D design graduates, uh, Ian Coxall and Oscar McNaughton, uh, from an internship program that we ran around this. Um, and one of the benefits of this is that makers can then signal to one another in their own publicity that they're a member of the Green Maker Initiative. So they can also sort of raise the profile of what's happening. And they can also say, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing this. This is something that I'm involved in. And one of the, the kind of questions around this is that it could be open to greenwashing. So anyone can put a logo on and say that they're doing it and it could look good. But what does that actually mean in practice? So we're very conscious of that, but um, because we're asking people to, to say this publicly um, and they have their on the website and um, uh, their business on there if they wish, um, that there is an element of accountability to the community. Um, but ultimately it's down, it's down to trust. So they, they get to use the, the logo. Obviously, if people don't submit the report either, then they, there is a question about if they can con continue to be a member. So that's really important. There is a commitment there. Um, they get this beautiful um, Green Maker Initiative button, which um, is made from recycled plastics, um, created by um, the Precious Plastics from in Tavistock, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and we also run events. So this um, was one of our first events which was an um, online event, um, Creative Practices that Tread Lightly on the Earth. And I think Lauren, um, Dr. Lauren England is in the audience online. And uh, she is an expert in crafts and sustainability working at King's College London. Uh, Julian uh, Leadham, uh, a collaborator, um, work, uh, created some really interesting work, which I'll mention again later. Carol Overy from Creative Carbon Scotland was there and Jane Hebra, who I think is also on the online audience from Plymouth Scrap Store, who are doing an amazing job. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and then we also held the, the, green, the first in-person Green Maker Initiative event uh, in February uh, this year, um, which was brilliant. Um, Hannah organised the uh, second sale, so there was a kind of interface there. We had exemplar makers, green maker initiative makers, showing their practice. Um, I think uh, Christina Peters was one of those. She's in our audience here as well. So we talked uh, to Christina, the pharmacist. Um, and um, we also launched the materials exchange at that event, which is um, materials which um, a very similar idea that's been talked about. <laughs> it's, um, 
slightly uh, less involved potentially because um, people donate their materials and things that they don't um, find useful for themselves. So this is Andrew Silsbury here with some beautiful veneer. He makes, um, he's donated that and then people can just come along and swap it for something that they're donating. Um, so we have all manner of things across all of the crafts from, from leather to um, uh, silk to paper to any, any materials you can possibly think of. And um, Make Southwest have made a space, a permanent space in their upstairs where people can come and access on certain days of the week so that any um, grain makers can use that. And um, we also have manufacturers from Devon donating materials as well. And so that's um, so waste materials from all different industries. So that's that's an interesting. Um, um, so getting back to the idea of collecting data, am I running over? No, it's fine. Um, so um, we created this uh, giant map on the walls of the Make Southwest Gallery, and um, fifty of the members, I think there was, I can't remember how many there were at that time. Um, uh, took part and they submitted a small amount of data about the key actions that they were taking, where they were based and um, what their practice was. So we were able to gather some of that data and people were able to interact with this. And then um, other makers, Green Maker Initiative members also came and hand wrote labels as well. Um, so this was a really interesting um, point in the process to be able to um, to see what people were doing. So I collated um, that data, and here's just a sample of some of the, the, the things from the, the ceramics, uh, ceramicists who um, gave their ideas. So there's a whole range of different, uh, and these aren't necessarily new innovations, but um, and some of them are, some of us, uh, and some of them are new to some people and not new to others, but it was this idea of sharing. So for example, being able to reduce the firing temperature, which is a major thing. So, uh, use of carbon, obviously the use of the kilns, but also about practicing in terms of kiln stacking, um, in terms of water use, a whole range of different ideas. And we were able to share um, some of these ideas. And then of course, um, across all the different areas, we've got data around the textiles, um, around the use of wood, around um, glass, and so on. Um, another thing that we've done since then is that we've digitized the, the physical map into a, a Google map. And now makers um, are plotted on this map. So this is accessible to anyone and they can use this to promote their um, practices as well. And this is, um, Hannah's embedded this now on the um, Make Southwest uh, Great Maker Initiative website. And um, the next stage of the Green Maker Initiative is the Green Maker Initiative Award. And this is all about how can the exhibitions which Make Southwest usually hold, which are professional makers from all different fields, from photography, sculpture, um, all of the different crafts that you can imagine, how can those exhibitions um, uh, recognise the work of makers who aren't members of the Green Maker Initiative, they can be from anywhere in the world, but recognise where they are um, engaging in good practice around sustainability. So there is an award um, for that's given to um, exhibitors um, in each exhibition. Um, and also what we're doing is we're developing a book which is um, forthcoming spring 2023. So we're featuring Green Maker Initiative members, their, their practices, um, what they're doing and um, beautiful photographs and um, strategies and we've got um, this is being supported by uh, a, a critical structure, theoretical structure with um, leading people in the field. Um, as some of them are listed here. Um, Lauren I uh, mentioned earlier, um, uh, Katie Dragoon, um, and uh, Alessandra um, Plasley, who's a um, PhD student from Kingston University, is in the audience here today, is doing some fascinating research on communities and craft and sustainability. So um, she'll be writing for us as well. And we've also developed a film, Green Maker Initiative film, which was made by um, John Nels, JM Media, 
um, and where we interviewed lots of makers about their practices. And that we'll be showing that today um, in the lunch lab. And um, Polly McPherson, who works here at the University of Plymouth, um, she was going to be here today to um, speak with you, but she's able to make, unable, unable to make it in person, but she is online. And she um, is talking about what the role of educators can do in teaching um, designer makers sustainability, which is a really important area. And I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Emma. So we had um, a question online from Liz, who was basically asking whether, um, I'm just going to pick this up straight away because it came from your presentation, Emma, whether there's any eco-scolding or eco-shaming when um, that arose when people started putting Greenmaker badges on their, on their websites or, or uh, attaching it to their, their businesses or their practices. And did that put people off? Um, I haven't been aware of that. I don't know whether Hannah or Laura, who are in the audience, um, could comment on that. No, no, not that we've had reports of anyway. That's great. Thank you. And now we know that the audience response in the other room actually works, if, if a bit weirdly echoey, um, <laughs> which is which is great. It's certainly something that um, in our previous project we discovered happened in the music industry in particular that there were there were companies that were quite concerned about putting their eco credentials on because they were afraid of backlash if they didn't live up fully to their the expectations they set up and ironically that meant that they didn't actually share best practice yeah <laughs> so <laughs> which prevented best practice from being shared which is which is very, very interesting in itself. So um, I'm going to go to the, the, oh, you'll also notice that we turned on closed captions. Um, it took us a while to figure out how to do that. So apologies for those people who would uh, have liked them before now. So I'm going to go back to the question that I hinted at before Emma's presentation, and open it up to, to all of you, which is for Emma and Simon to think, you heard uh, Rachel's you know, wish list of, of a network and having had experience of setting up networks, was there any any feedback or any advice you might be able to to give us in the idea of setting up perhaps a a cross sector place based network from your from your experience? But equally, Rachel, is there anything that you heard that you thought, ah, that's great. Um, that's exactly what I was hoping to find out about. I, I immediately think that the uh, Green Makers Initiative um, uh, it shouts out to me that it could work cross sector for sure. I mean, a few little notes of things that immediately popped into my head of things that I would actively use within that existing network. Um, so I think that's great. And um, it would be interesting to know if those networks that have already existed for one sector would open themselves up to inviting other people, maybe not to. For example, not maybe we wouldn't become a green maker, but maybe there would be a way that we could access certain things within that network um, to interact with the makers that are part of it and the uh, resources that you've got and developed. Um, uh, I also would love to hear a bit more from Simon about the practicalities of how the network um, exists and what the how how practically it works would be really interesting to know um i think that you've talked really beautifully about the theories behind it but i'd love to know on the ground how it's how you're interacting with those different um sectors yeah really really happy to to share that well it's been quite quite a kind of journey and it's kind of uh, taken a bit of patience along the way. It started as a coalition of the willing, I would say. Well, we're really fortuitously, it was a meeting of leaders and then kind of austerity hit, and then it became people within organisations and, you know, uh, uh, and I was within the kind of Royal Exchange Theatre. And what it did, the, the, the bit about being cross-sector is theatre people tend to know each other, particularly museum people know each other, gallery people know each other, but not necessarily... Uh, uh, to people kind of move out of their sectors so kind of in, in the history of kind of how, how the city is networked it was very early on it put together all sorts of people in all sorts of different sectors uh, mm -hmm. to kind of learn from each other and it was really interesting um, one one thing I, I I kind of would also say is is that 
uh, it, it created kind of those connections and some of the gold was in the meetings and a lot of it wasn't as people began to kind of explore best practice and how it was kind of applicable. Um, each sector always thinks, each bit of a sector thinks it's special, of course, uh, but actually the more you talk, the more you realise you've got you've got stuff in common. And we've never kind of uh, uh, differentiated really about where the money comes from. So obviously there is the subsidised sector but also there is the commercial or kind of uh, limited company sector. And we think it's really important to kind of mix that up because the subsidized world uh, uh, is kind of paid to do a lot of thinking. The corporate world is, is kind of very kind of concerned with action so they can move really quickly. So, so kind of up here somewhere, something like ITV Coronation Street is made in an in incredibly kind of environmentally friendly way now because of individuals who've driven driven that but also because they've got the kind of resources to kind of uh, 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 to kind of make those those kind of differences. Something else that I think is really really kind of useful is that it doesn't matter uh, what people's roles are within an organisation. And again, it's great to have people who work in a production capacity. It's great to have people who work in a facilities capacity. But it's not just those areas uh, when you're thinking about organisations uh, uh, that need to be kind of represented. I think kind of programming is really important. Uh, uh, communications are really important. And again, once you mix up those different kinds of skills um uh, it can be really useful uh, in terms of the practicalities of the network and we've existed for a long time as what you would describe as an informal network we've uh, uh we ask uh, uh organizations who are participating to make a kind of annual contribution that creates a small fund for us to spend on kind of projects uh, or to kind of maintain our website and to kind of follow things through on, on, on behalf of the sector. We're, we're just kind of coming to the end of uh, a development project that Arts Council England have funded because we've realized that we're, we're kind of at the end of the road of being an informal network. Uh, now that meets kind of quarterly uh, uh, more often if there's specific things but we're looking because we very much are committed to our city regions so that's greater manchester manchester is only one of 10 districts you know of greater manchester um that it's really important that we kind of sort of permeate right the way through the through the kind of city region and in order to do that we we, we need to kind of develop some resources uh, uh, and also to follow up some of the amazing opportunities there are with kind of higher education across the region. You know, some really interesting research coming out of kind of all kinds of places that would be great and it'd be great to kind of explore and that culture uh, um, is, is an amazing place, as, as I was saying in the presentation, to explore kind of uh, explore different models. Does that answer it? Sorry, it's probably quite long. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I kind of wanted to pick up on the issue of funding, which is, has sort of haunted everything. I mean, Polly left a, a message about how the GMI um, funding is coming to the end in March and what happens after that. But there's also this sense of what actually, what, what money has to be put in place to enable these things to happen? Is it, is it just money in the initial stages to get things kick, kicked off? Do we think that there needs to be sort of, sort of subscriptions by people? How do, how do we do this? And um, as you pointed out, Simon, it, we've moved way beyond austerity now, right? <laughs> it was bad enough, but now we're somewhere else. So, how do we create uh, I'm this is an open question i'm kind of way of the subscription model because i think that there's um it automatically excludes a large uh, portion of um smaller companies and individuals um who then can't bec become part of those networks um so i think you'd have to think really carefully about who you uh, ask to subscribe in a monetary way and who you allow to just be part of it um in in exchange for their skill base and uh, resource sharing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's really I think that's really important because uh, we've never wanted money to be the key to the door or a seat at the table, if you like. So for those organisations who can contribute, it, it's great. But kind of for those who can't or kind of individuals, you know, it's absolutely fine. You're, you're right. Being part of the conversation is, is, is the most important thing, not 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 the uh, not an annual check. So in terms of um, funding coming to an end for Green Maker Initiative, so the low carbon down funding is coming to the end, but the Green Maker Initiative um, was supported through low carbon down funding, but because Make Southwest are hosting it, they are continuing with the Green Maker Initiative and they have gone for Arts Council England funding, which has supported um, them doing lots of activities, not just the events that I mentioned, but the events that Hannah has been organising as well online events around the Green Maker Initiative, and there is one on Saturday as well, which I forgot to plug that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so I think in answer to your question, it, it, perhaps there's something to do with partnerships there. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the organisation isn't like a free floating thing, but maybe it's attached to other organisations which can leverage money in from their own budgets in some way um, to try and. Um, not ask members to, to make um, a big contribution, especially if they're underfunded themselves. Yeah, I was, I was interested actually, because obviously one of the things that I'm interested in is how you create a system that becomes self-sustaining. Um, and I wonder if you could foresee a version in the future of the Green Makers Initiative that could become self-sustaining, or if you think that actually really does need to have funds attached to it to enable it to continue. Well, I suppose it depends on the form of it and what, and what different attributes you want that system or network to, to have. Because one of the beauties of it being hosted by Make South West is the fact that there, there are already people working there doing organising things, have got access to members, but they've also got their own website, which they're supporting anyway. So it's a page within that. And then um, being able to um, promote events through that and also have a, some kind of hub for members to, to kind of connect into. So there's already a network. If you were self-supporting that, there would probably need to be someone, even if they're doing it on a voluntary basis, who is looking after some kind of online presence, even if it's a free social media mm -hmm. platform, also promoting the events to organise. You know, there would be a lot of... Um, it might feel self-sustaining, but there would be someone or some people sustaining it. Mm -hmm. And who who is doing that? And is that something that they're doing as part of another job, perhaps? Or is it something they're doing as a voluntary effort? Does anybody in our in the room next door, would anybody like to add to this conversation about funding, um, sustaining a network once it begins? Any other issue? I'll leave that with you. You can you can wave your hand. Okay. Well, as as you're thinking, we've got one. We've got one question. Oh, okay, great. I have my glasses on, and yet <laughs> you know, looking through all the screens. Is, <laughs> so, what's her question? Um, well, it's not about so the question. I oh, think um, responding to what Rachel said and what was said online. Um, I think it should be local, um, and it maybe can go outside the sector. So. Here to throw something out, perhaps they can go to school or look outside your centre. Um, and also, the day online for the scrap store, I was just plug, plug the scrap store. The scrap store already is a hub which takes um, waste materials from the businesses and they will take waste materials from the theatre and pass them on to the schools and groups and items. And um, so, there may already be something there. I know that there are um, things that I've, I've come across, like the, I know the RSC give their offcuts and, and scraps to local scrap stores or, or equivalents as well. So I've heard things moving in various directions, but not necessarily um, related to production work. And um, I haven't ever taken, I haven't ever got things from the scrap store, but I have taken things to it. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't in the future. I, they definitely exist on my radar as a resource, for sure. But you also raised a really interesting question about scales and models and how local 
Yeah. You know, how local are we going and what does that mean in terms of transportation um, and, and things like that as well. So the suggestion that you know, maybe very local, maybe, you know, Plymouth and surrounding areas, um, as opposed to across the entire <laughs> Northeast, you know, there are, there are different scales and models in which, to, in which to work as well in setting up these networks. There's one self-sustaining network that I've, it's self-sustaining in the fact that the users aren't doing anything. Is I think you probably come across this, there is a free cycle theatre sharing materials and anyone can put stuff up there and say that they want to come and collect it. I think there is some kind, you need to prove that you are a, um, a theatre venue, not just anyone who wants the materials. Yeah, yeah. But I think that that does self-sustain or at least free cycle sustaining it for you. Mm -hmm. What are yours? Uh, nobody can see me. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm off camera doing the tech, but I, I, I'm aware of that platform, and I've also heard that it's not particularly reliable because um, it's the, the, the issue with it being um, self-sustaining is that people don't always mark when things are gone or if somebody else has taken it. And, yeah, a free, free cycle as a platform, I think, has got a lot of uh, glitches to it, so that it's not like ideally based to host that sort of thing yet. Um, I, I feel like we haven't quite found the the right format for this resource sharing that everybody, everyone seems really keen to share their resources, but we haven't quite figured out how we do that. Um, that seems to be the main issue, which I would love to find a workable solution to that everyone's happy with. <laughs> so, yeah, if anyone's got any bright ideas about what, what, how we do it, that'd be great. <laughs> set exchange. Yeah, That's set exchange. Cool. Yeah. There's set ex yeah, and there is set exchange too, and there's prop exchange too, but yeah. Um, so it was almost a throwaway comment, Simon, but you, you mentioned about something about overcoming barriers to action. Mm. Um, so I was wondering if you could identify some of the key barriers to action that you found out, especially in cross-sector working, and if you had any um, solutions to move to, you know, to, to move through those barriers. <laughs> sure, I've got some suggestions. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, when, when you talk about climate or the climate and ecological crisis, you're immediately in a zone where people are feeling powerless and they're feeling deflated and they're feeling uh, uh, that, that, that uh, the challenge is insurmountable. It's incredibly important to inject positivity and that's why culture uh, is, is so important uh, part of the, the discourse, uh, I think. So kind of challenge challenge the, the, the kind of head in hands uh, and focus on what, what people can do. You can't solve everything, but you can certainly kind of solve some things. Uh, I also kind of really think that when we silo uh, environmental or climate work or green work to an individual, within an organization that that also is really unhelpful organizations who are really addressing the climate crisis have embraced it as a whole organization and don't put it into just one role uh, it it works kind of a, a, a across the kind of uh, it works across the organization because of course you know when when we we work from the bottom up we work from top down we meet in the middle uh, uh, and that's kind of incredibly important and and also kind of like um uh we don't need to reinvent the wheel we we, we created an e-learning tool as part of the uh um uh, part of the european project and really what it did is just took our framework talking about local you know our response to local climate climate targets but but kind of put them in a structure and then signposted the absolute wealth of information there is kind of out there in a, in a way that people could kind of research or kind of follow particular particular kind of areas of uh, areas areas of interest and and one of the brilliant things about kind of networks or systems or however we want to describe it is is, is kind of community building uh, and that's where place ba a place based approach is, is is kind of really is really brilliant you know uh, uh so you're not you're not trying to uh, you're not doing this on your own you're doing this as part of a group and a, a group which which 
spans far beyond your kind of own individual practice or your uh, or your organisation. Thank you. Um, we're, we're almost at the end of this session, which has been incredibly rich and informative, and I think is going to really set up our se sessions for later. It actually reminds me of some of the things, uh, uh, the findings from our project so far, because as you probably noticed earlier, my slide didn't appear, so I was just like, remembering them <laughs> and I'm still remembering them um, but one of the things that I am actually remembering is the importance for everybody to be involved but I really do mean everybody it comes out over and over again the importance of the directors of the company and the boards of governors of, of companies to be absolutely involved um, in these initiatives um, in, in a theatre context one of the things that has been quite surprising um, and it shouldn't have been, is the importance of getting actors involved because in a theatre making context we often revolve around the designers. I've often heard in, in our discussions that designers felt that so much uh, pressure on them to be the ones that were sustainable. And I don't think it's um, a coincidence that a lot of our sustainability champions within our, our Green Book case studies have all been production managers as well. And I think there's definitely a need to sort of share and, and rethink um, where sustainability is located so that it is it is rhizomatic as opposed to in the hands of a, of a specific individual for one reason or another. Um, and it did. There, there were definite different results in terms of the success and the, the achieving of sustainable goals when you do not have everybody involved. Um, and we can talk about various reasons for that. But the second thing that, um, that was brought up both by, by Emma and by Simon is the role of, of audiences and um, taking audiences along. And that's not just using the arts as a kind of Cinderella industry to tell the stories of climate change, but also of, of, of responding to climate crisis, but actually demonstrates how culture and cultural organizations are responding to climate culture, uh, climate crisis. And I think um, that possibly isn't being communicated enough. It's that sort of, how are we actually explaining how our sets are green, how, how our touring, how our practices are green. And um, I was reminded this morning of the report by Indigo called Act Green, um, which was a survey of over 11,000 audience members, 90% of whom said it mattered that cultural organizations were green. It mattered that theaters um, were making their work sustainably. So, that's really fascinating to me and possibly another part, another piece of this puzzle <laughs> is um, not just what we're doing, but how we engage and include audiences and consumers and clients in these networks as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so with that, what I really want to do is thank Rachel and Simon and Emma for um, sharing their knowledge and their dreams and their insights and